Um, I'm going to make, Lori, I'm going to assign you as host. Okay. And then I'm going to, I'm going to um, excuse myself once you're, once you're ready. Let me make sure I know how to, I've not hosted a webinar before, I've hosted plenty of Zoom meetings. So I want to make sure I know how to let people in. Uh, yes. So if you, if you, um, if you click on the Got participants it. at the bottom, and then if you click on attendees, you should be able to pull people in. Yep. The other thing just to tell you, Lori, is um, just in case you need other folks on the call to be able to share their screens, I if you go to the share the share screen feature and enable them to share. Okay, so right. make sure it's something. Right, one person I can share at a time, so we're good. So everybody can share. So yeah, looks good. Okay. That, that part cool. I know. All right, All right. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll excuse myself and have a good meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. And welcome, Caitlin and Miguel. Thank uh, you. Hi, uh, thanks. Hi. And hello, everyone. Hi to our attendee. OK, so this is the uh, August 2nd meeting of the Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee. Uh, we have a pretty full agenda tonight because we have our two, um, two interns who are going to talk to us a bit about their projects this summer. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me just get to my notes here uh, with a review of the minutes so I can share the minutes. Now, I have a request, which is that um, whoever's going to be taking notes today, and we have to decide that now, should please send both me and um, Stephanie copies of the draft um, because I missed something last week that I had to go back and correct that some of you may have noticed in the annual report. It's been corrected, I'll talk about it later. Um, but I just forgot something we had discussed and I didn't get the minutes until just recently. So until when you guys did. So let me share this, sorry. Um, CAC agenda minutes, there they are, share. Sorry, this is taking a moment. There, now I can see you all. Are you sharing that? Oh, wait, it's not, something's wrong. I'm not sharing the right thing, am I? There you are. Can you see the... Minutes? Yeah. That's weird. Minutes. Oh yeah. Okay. That's right. Good. Got it. Um, okay. So I added one thing to the minutes in yellow here. Um, I added the link to the seminar that Laura mentioned last week. Did anyone else see anything in the minutes that needs to be fixed or addressed? So I, it looks like I'm supposed to take minutes today. Oh, right. We need to do I that. apologize. I actually can't do that because I'm the only parent home right now <laughs> um, and will be for the duration of the meeting. So if somebody else could, that would be amazing. Um, and I can pick up an extra minute taking shift when I have another adult in the house. <laughs> That's fine. Um, Dwayne, do you want to go ahead and take? Uh, yep. If I'm next, I'm happy to do that for sure. Okay. Yep. Um, so yep, let me... Uh, We'll go, go ahead. I'll get organized. Right. I'm <laughs> skipping me because I have a hard time chairing and. Oh, no, 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 not you. Yep. Um, okay. So, are there any comments? So, the thing that I forgot is I sat down about a week after the meeting to finally finish off the annual report and send it in. And I finished it off like on Friday and sent it into sent it into Stephanie at some point. I, there was gaps in between all of this because I kept getting busy with things. And I didn't the minutes didn't get to me until the 31st, which was after I'd worked on the report. And I had totally forgotten about the importance of adding um, adding the comment, or is it? Uh, about annual report review, emphasizing that departmental activities within both within the department and the larger community should be a focus. So I did put that into the town manager goal section, but only in a correction. It's not in the copy that you guys got. 
So I have to send the corrected version. I did send the corrected version to Stephanie just before the meeting. So I saw this about two hours ago and was like, oh no, I forgot about that. So I made that change as well as did a proofread through the whole thing and made sure everything was in good order. Anything else here that we need to talk about? Or does somebody want to move to accept minutes? I can move to accept the minutes. Second. I'll be happy to second. If nobody else does, move this forward. Are you ready for a vote or are people still reading? Should try to read them beforehand if possible. So should we go ahead and uh, take a vote then? So I'll do what Stephanie usually does in no particular order. Jesse? Yes, uh, Stella? Actually, I'm abstained, technically. Oh, you're abstained, okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Dwayne? Yes. Um, Don? Yes. And a yes from me. So passes. We adopt the minutes with uh, four yeses and an abstention. Okay, I believe, let me stop sharing. That the next thing on the agenda is public comment. So, Martha? If you um, have a comment for us, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. I will, uh, I think Stephanie usually promotes you to a panelist for this or does she just allow you to talk? Let's try allow to talk, see how that works. Go ahead, Martha. Yep. Yeah, well, I really did. Whoops, can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Did I accidentally mute you? No, I didn't. I don't think so. You're muted. Okay, I didn't have anything uh, profound to say, but since you asked me, uh, I was, I'm interested to know whether you folks as a, as a committee are following or thinking about the Hickory Ridge at all in terms of the large picture of whether, uh, you know, you see uh, great things in terms of environmental uh, aspects for development or planting trees or uh, nature trails or anything like that. And also then the uh, solar array, uh, whether you've been following that development at all. And apparently there's a concern about the um, type of battery that's been selected for that facility because it's the same make as ones that have been causing some fires at various locations around recently around New York State and, and places. So I just, you know, raise that as a, a potential subject you folks might be interested in. So that's all. <laughs> well, you put it on my radar screen, but I don't have any comment other than that. Um, yes. Anyone have any? Yeah. It's just, you know, I see lots of possibilities for Hickory Ridge, and I should think that maybe you folks might, uh, you know, dream a little about it or, or think of, of what opportunities there might be in the future. And also then the concern about the solar array. So thank you. Thank you, Martha. Let's see, how do I put you back in? Not sure how to put you back in the participants. I, hmm. No, that didn't work. <laughs> I just hid you, but you're still there. Um, hold on a moment. Hmm. 
Well, I promise I'll behave if you <laughs> there. Really All right. Behave. If nothing else, you can I'll stay do. there as a participant. I'm just trying to figure out. Oh, change role to attendee. I found it. So thank you again, Martha. Hmm. Yeah, there you go. All right. So let's go to um, the next agenda item, which is the presentation by Caitlin and Miguel. Where did Caitlin and Miguel go? Ah, there's Miguel. Miguel, yes. And Caitlin, there you are. <laughs> Hello, sorry, we just Hi. had our videos off. Um, uh, okay. Oh, and I accidentally hid non video participants, and I didn't mean to do that. So let me try to fix that. Um, how did I do that? I did that by accident. Oh, good. Um, oh, no. <laughs> I don't know how to undo that. This webinar good. stuff is a little more complicated than the usual. I can keep mine on. I just had it off because my internet was really bad. But now I'm good. Well, if I next time someone turns one off, I will try to figure out. I think I just have to promote you back to visible. But uh, let's go ahead and do it. So go ahead. Um, who would like to go first? Sure. Um, I am going to go first, and then Miguel will follow. Um, so let me try to share my screen. All right. I'm going to ask the question everyone asks. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, super. And then let me see if I can make it full screen for us. Um, cool. Okay. Um, so hello, Energy and Climate Action Committee. Uh, my name is Caitlin Hart. I am a sustainability fellow with the town of Amherst for the summer working on updating um, the greenhouse gas inventory. It was last updated in 2017. Um, and I am also a graduate student at Tufts University uh, studying environmental policy and planning. So uh, very grateful to, to be here. Um, and I'm just going to give a quick um, presentation about my project this summer. Uh, it is not yet complete because our fellowship lasts for about two, two and a half more weeks. So I'm sorry, I can't share the full picture with you all today, but of course you will see all of the final deliverables um, closer to the end of the summer. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing any thoughts and feedback that you all might have about where I'm currently at. So the 2023 greenhouse gas inventory update. Um, I, I don't think I have to remind any of you all uh, what the climate goals are. Um, stated in the Climate Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan, or CARP, but just for a refresher, um, using the baseline year of 2016, uh, the town of Amherst has committed to some ambitious reduction goals, um, reducing the 2020-16 emissions amount by 25% by 2025, uh, reducing by 50% by 2030, and uh, reducing entirely by 2050. And so I just gave, I'm sorry, I don't have graphs right now. There will be uh, good graphs in the report, um, but I gave us some numbers based on the community-wide inventory. So that um, accounts for Maybe not only sorry. municipally- um, Sorry to interrupt you. I yeah. don't know if maybe, I'm not seeing, I'm still seeing your intro slide. Oh, really? Not sure if anybody else oh. is having a problem. Um, it looks like my screen sharing is paused. Thank you for. Oh, what um, happened? I, that may have been me. Thank you for letting me know that. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no um, worries. Let me just stop sharing and then try to start again. Yeah. Sorry that's about that, folks. <clears throat> that's strange. Okay. Let's try again. Again, oh, screen yes. sharing, active, new slide. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. I don't think you missed anything um, exciting. <laughs> yeah, okay. So these are some numbers. Obviously they're like 
hard to grapple with. Um, I will do a better job of adding visualization um, in the final deliverables. However, just putting some numbers to the goals um, that were set out. So my task this year includes both a community-wide inventory as well as a municipal inventory. Um, so these are uh, numbers referring to the community-wide inventory, which will encompass kind of everything um, more or less within the geographic boundary of the town. Um, and then I kind of extrapolated uh, from the 2016 municipal numbers, um, some numbers that we will be aiming toward for the municipal emissions, which um, encompasses everything kind of controlled by the uh, municipality, so the town government operations. Okay, so I have kind of three components to my project this summer. First is to update the existing inventory. I am very fortunate that the fellow who came before me um, created a robust framework. And so it's been um, it's been relatively easy to plug and play um, with what Taylor set up years ago. So update the the numbers of the inventory then try to assess the pro progress made toward the 2025 goals um, and then recommend um, in alignment with recommendations that are in the CARP action to further reduce emissions um, and really try and meet that upcoming 2025 goal. So my deliverables include workbooks for both the municipal inventory and the community-wide inventory. Um, there will be a workbook user guide, which um, may be less interesting to the committee, but will be super useful um, to anyone updating this inventory in the future. Similarly, the methodology document will be um, useful for anyone updating the inventory in the future. And then a final report um, to summarize the findings and proposed next steps um, based on the inventories. Um, so the status of these items currently, um, the municipal inventory is in pretty good shape. However, I do need to do kind of a QA, QC check um, to make sure that, um, you know, just double check to make sure that um, calculations and the data entered are in good shape. Um, the community inventory, there are a couple of places where I need to add some empirical data as well as some modeled data. So I don't have any numbers to share um, with you on that side today. I apologize, but they are coming. Um, the workbook user guide and the methodology document, I'm kind of updating as I go along, uh, working on the workbooks, and then the report is kind of the final step. Um, again, there exists a document that, that the previous fellow um, created that I can update, but I'm going to try and look at some um, more accessible and um, simple ways to present the findings, probably in a graphics heavy executive summary. So, this is kind of our municipal inventory numbers at a glance. Um, there's obviously more detail in the workbooks, but as you can see, um, we kind of have actual numbers here for, um, and I should clarify, these are fiscal years 2016 and 2022. So beginning in July and ending in June, sorry for my noisy cat in the background. Um, and then we have what, what should be our um, 2025 <laughs> sorry, numbers. Um, so you can see kind of at the bottom, it looks like, um, you know, these are not, don't take these as final numbers, but it looks like we are, we are on track. We're moving in the right direction. However, some more, um, some more action uh, may need to be taken to reach that 2025 goal. And I'll also note kind of the discrepancy or the big leap in heating oil emissions. Uh, that is something I need to look into during kind of my quality check. Um, 
we think it may just it may be unreported or missing heating oil data from FY 2016. Um, and that's why it seems like it seems like we're using a lot more heating oil in, in FY 2022. Um, however, I think it it is probably likely that some buildings usage wasn't accounted for in 2016. <laughs> um, and then, as I said, I'm sorry, I do not have community inventory numbers. I feel comfortable sharing with you all at this point in time. How? Um, but they are coming. Um, so to reiterate, there, there remains, it sounds like a lot of work to do. Um, however, the kind of community inventory workbook user guide and methodology document is just kind of tying up of little loose ends. And then the report and analysis um, will be perhaps substantial, but um, you know, it's all, it's kind of all working toward the report. Um, and that is what I have for you all today. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And apologies for referring to you as interns before, your fellows. So it's, <laughs> it's basically the same thing. Fellows just sounds better. <laughs> You're working at a slightly higher level than I think than, than one usually thinks of interns working. So, um, so it's very nice, very nice work. Um, I am shocked to see that heating oil. I really do hope you solve to figure out what, what's going on there. Um, I think, yeah. yeah. Any questions for Caitlin? Oh, I see Jesse. Hi, Caitlin. Thank you. I this is one of my favorite spreadsheets of that I've seen. It's I love it's it. I think it's super important. So just love. I, you seem to have dug into it in a great way. So first of all, thank you for taking it all on. Uh, I think it's super important. My question is how much energy or how much have you been able to look at the the methane kind of which i is what some people call natural gas i think um i like methane sounds better to me or toxic combustible gas however you yeah, want to call it thank you the, the fugitive emissions of that not just in direct pipes into amherst but also as those pipes go to our electricity production is that mm -hmm. something is the a, is, did that change, um, or did you look at those fugitive emissions specifically, or is it just the same factor applied as last time? Yeah, it's um, it's these are modeled numbers, so it's not data that I've um, obtained from Berkshire Gas or EverSource. Um, I don't think I asked, but I would certainly be willing to to ask and try to get those real numbers. Um, that was something a colleague of mine from elsewhere recommended. So thank you for that reminder. Um, it's worth a shot. And also thank you for that note on language. I don't know if the town of Amherst or the ECAC largely agrees, but at least in my small edits, I've been changing natural gas to methane gas, because um, I believe language, yeah, around this is important. Thank it's, you for yeah. that question. Totally. So just to follow up on that, that's an interesting thing. It just occurred to me, maybe this is obvious and everybody knows this, but um, you know, we all get our gas bills. We know what our meter readings are, and you assume the gas company knows how much they're actually delivering, so they ought to be able to tell you how much they're losing. Um, maybe that's what exactly what you were talking about. Yeah, I think there's the, and and even if it's not a, a recorded amount, oftentimes it's it's like a factor or a percentage. Mm -hmm. So if we're right. if our assumption is X delivered, then we add X plus something right. is the actual amount, <laughs> and it's and it's and it's a different, um, but it's also a different. Um, factor in the atmosphere because the burnt methane at your home is much less of a global warming potential than the released methane from yeah. the, the frack to right I, I think everybody knows this but i'm just yeah 
it's but a it different uh, that, number. That difference, that difference has to be known by the gas company, right? Because oh, they know that's because it's attached know. to dollars. If they know, yeah. well, they don't. They don't say they. They they will not say they know. They won't tell you. No, I mean they pretend they don't know. They don't know because it is attached to dollars, but they don't care. Yeah. So they have they haven't been track. They don't track. Um, they don't track this stuff. And and Stella has her hands up, so I want to recognize Stella. Um, go go ahead, Stella. Yeah, thank you so much, Caitlin. This is really really interesting. Do the my question is that do the does the vehicle fleet does the off road sector include equipment like chippers, blowers, that kind of thing? Yes. Amazing. Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Excellent. Any other questions for Caitlin? Last question from me, hopefully. Um, you're, this is your area of expertise. Sounds like you're talking to colleagues and everything. Like, what do you think of our inventory? Does this feel like a, you, like someone did good work to prepare you? Like, this seemed like a good one. Have you seen others? Like, how, how are we doing, in your opinion, as far as keeping track of these things? Sure. Um, I, may not have as much experience as you think. Um, so I'm not sure if I can exactly answer your question. Um, I think that uh, Taylor, who was the fellow in 2017, did a very, very thorough job of um, setting up a workbook that anyone can use if they have the activity data. Um, so I think that you know, other municipalities may be using software that is theoretically easier, but this is actually a pretty, like, a pretty robust um, and accessible, because it's in Excel, framework. Um, I have been able to speak with a couple of fellow fellows and former fellows who have done inventories. Um, this one seems pretty comparable to what other folks are doing, you know, because we're using the um, the GPC uh, greenhouse gas protocol framework, which I think a lot of folks are using. Um, one of my fellow fellows who is working for the town of Durham, New Hampshire this summer um, is kind of tackling or is supposed to be tackling, I haven't checked in with her in a while, but um, uh, an inventory that includes consumption related emissions. Um, I have a background of basic literacy and embodied carbon. So I think that's, you know, I don't think anyone's including those in their inventories right now, but it would be cool to see. Um, I think a question, for me starting out in this project was, um, do I approach this apples to apples using accounting for exactly what the previous fellow um, accounted for? Or do I approach this comparing apples to more apples? Um, and, you know, for the purposes of this project, um, for the limited 10 weeks that I have to do this work, it ended up being apples to apples. And I think that makes sense. Um, but you know, there's always there's always more that can be accounted for. Sorry, that was a long answer to your question. Yeah, that's good. Always more apples. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Um, if not, Miguel, would you like to? Uh... Or let me share my screen. Um, uh, and my internet hasn't been working super well, so let me know if it gets really choppy and I'll try um, uh, eliminating my video. Uh, let's see if that helps. Um, all right, so yeah, my name is Miguel, and I am also a sustainability fellow through UNH, um, but I'm a student at UMass Amherst in the 
sustainability science program focusing on renewable energy and efficient design. And this is the practicum component of my degree. So I will be graduating in September or essentially at the end of August when I'm done with this project. Uh, my project is to take the or to create an inventory of HVAC equipment in Amherst municipal buildings and from that creating a building electrification strategy. So the intent of this project is to create a database of all of the HVAC equipment in all of Amherst buildings, including heating and cooling equipment, any auxiliary systems, uh, making note of the distribution system of the building. So if it's hydronic, uh, hot water or steam or air, uh, et, et cetera. And then as kind of a additional component, we've also documented on-site uh, or backup generators because they are also combusting fossil fuels uh, at that site. Um, but it's just an additional part and mostly just for documentation. And from this database that I'm creating, uh, the hope is to be able to approximate emissions reductions through electrification, create a strategy and a prioritization rubric for building electrification, financial analysis, sort of secondary to the emissions reductions, um, since it's going to be pretty rough numbers. Um, and additional, additionally to this, um, the database will be useful for the facilities department, just having an inventory of what they're servicing and maintaining um, all in one all in one place, not necessarily needing to go on site to troubleshoot or just know what's at each building. And similarly, I am in this part of my project where I have lots of analysis still left to do, um, but I haven't. I, I mean, I have started all of them. I just have not finished them. So I don't have a whole lot to report, um, but I can I can discuss some of these a little bit further. But what I have completed is all of the site visits and documentation of all the equipment into a single spreadsheet. And um, most of these components are pretty interconnected, but kind of my logic goes through this diagram in a clockwise fashion where I'm going to approximate emissions reductions um, from the inventory that I've created. Uh, the inventory will inform my financial analysis, both the emissions reductions and financial analysis will inform my prioritization rubric slash timeline, which is the strategy that I am proposing of what I, or of how I think this will happen. And then finally, um, I will summarize this in a in a report documenting each building, um, their, uh, each building's profile. Um, what I can report today is just a breakdown of um, each building's uh, heating by fuel type and domestic hot water by fuel type. Um, I did not include in these graphs buildings that have no heating or cooling. Uh, it's about 17 of the of the buildings, uh, there's about 50 or 52 buildings, I think, total. Um, it kind of just took up too much of the pie to, to really show what's out there, um, mainly fuel oil and gas. And the one, one building that has already installed electric heat pumps isn't open yet, and that's the North Amherst Library. Um, the North Amherst School does have heat pumps, uh, but it's only in half the building. So I wasn't sure if I should record that as a primary heat source or a secondary, but in either case. Uh, and domestic hot water, mostly electric resistance throughout the building stock, uh, but they have made an effort to uh, replace those as they retire with electric heat pump um, hot water heaters. And so far what I've collected, um, I'm still missing some consumption data, but so far what I've collected is an approximation of 60% reduction in um, CO2, I should have put an E on there, um, CO2 uh, equivalent of um, greenhouse gas emissions 
or just heating. Uh, my final deliverables, as I mentioned earlier, are going to be this HVAC inventory, which is going to be a large, large database uh, that includes models, serial numbers, uh, manufacturers, age of the equipment, um, if I can find it, which I can for most, uh, electrical information, stuff like that that's handy for facilities mostly, an emissions reductions estimation, uh, financial analysis uh, of electrification, and then this timeline that so far I've just broken it down into near, mid, and long term, and then I'll sort of estimate kind of that what each of those categories would be in terms of years um, so that it sort of fits between now and 2050 or sooner. Um, so actually going back to these, this list, I can sort of go a little bit deeper into at least my process for uh, two of them. My electric heating demand estimations um, is kind of built on little information. I'm not doing a, a full analysis of the building performance, uh, which would typically include uh, heat loss calculations through insulation and fenestration. Um, however, I am I do have access to the uh, amount of fuel that's being utilized at each site and kind of working my way backwards into an uh, electric heating equivalent. So what I've got is um, the gas supply, the efficiency of the boiler, um, and then assuming or thinking about it in terms of this whole system of the building losing heat on a cold day and occupants inside calling for heat and creating this system. Um, I was able to, I'll show on my next slide, uh, build this formula in Excel where I um, take the fuel use, convert it to kilowatt hours so that all of the units are uniform. Um, divide that by the heating degree days for a weather station that's close by, which I think was Chicopee. Um, I multiply that by the boiler efficiency, which again is an approximation uh, just taken from the data plate. So in the for the most part, it's a conservative estimate uh, on the higher end, just uh, originally what the efficiency was for um, the heat plant. So not necessarily a boiler, but for the most part, they're boilers in each building. And then um, the set point can be changed uh, in my calculation. Um, and I used Celsius for this because it didn't, didn't come out the way I wanted to for Fahrenheit for some reason. Um, and then all that divided by 24 to get rid of hours to get uh, heating demand in kilowatts, which can be converted to BTUs and then to tons. Um, and then the next piece, is the prioritization rubric. Uh, I kind of developed it starting from left to right, thinking about how, this is just my thought process of how I got to where I think it'll end up. Um, age being a pretty important component. Um, it's not ideal or necessarily financially the best idea to retire equipment early necessarily, especially since a lot of the equipment is old, but there is some new. Um, so needing more information to to add to the to the um, analysis, uh, I added area as a factor. Um, however, this doesn't really account for some of the buildings that aren't in use, and there are uh, a handful of those. So taking the ratio of age to ex how long it's expected for that equipment to last, and dividing that by the ratio of emissions per area gives, gives me uh, information about whether or not that building is being used. Um, and so, yeah. Um, however, earlier this week, uh, one of our advisors from UNH gave me this idea of uh, mapping out the emissions and uh, financial analysis. So whether I do return on investment or payback period, on two different axes. And um, that gives you a pretty good idea of what, what to electrify sooner because it'll cut the most emissions and give you the best payback period or return on investment. 
However, it does not consider the age of the equipment. So I guess I'm trying to do both or see if I can combine them into sort of a multi-decision criteria analysis and see maybe maybe the town can play around with the weights on on both of these to come up with a schedule that makes the most sense or or um, reflects their values the most whether they want to retire stuff early or consider the age or um, finance and yep that's my project um you guys have any questions or feedback are there questions Are you are you working with um, Adam Kohler at UNH for any chance? No. Um, Who so, is Adam? Sorry, he, he's he's a consulting engineer that I used to work with who who went to the sustainability department at UNH, and he's just he has a an expertise in sizing equipment, which oh, looks okay. like is what you're doing. And so I was curious if, if he was one of the people, and he's also a, a nice fellow. Um, I'm not technically a fellow, yeah. you're a fellow. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I, I have a couple of um, questions or comments. First of all, I'm um, really sort of surprised and a little disappointed to see how little of the municipality is using heat pumps as a primary heat source. Um, I have the feeling that the numbers in the community are quite a bit larger than that, but I guess we don't know. I just know in my own neighborhood, you know, I can think of quite a few families that now use primarily heat pumps. So I find that a little surprising and disappointing. Um, and then I have some technical questions about one of your equations that I didn't understand, but I think we'll go to um, Laura. I think your hand was up first, so go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Miguel. Did, for the costing discussion, or not quite costing, I guess, but um, I think there's a couple of things we should consider. And I don't, I'm not necessarily saying that you should do this analysis, but I think we should speak to it. One is that I think it's hard. I think it's not. I think you're exactly right that historically and by cost of capital, like replacing capital equipment that has more life left to it is not the most cost effective thing to do. Um, but I think what that misses out on are two things. One, of course, is just the cost of emitting carbon. Um, the other is that right now we have this historic moment where we have a lot of funding available for updating buildings. So it may actually be cost effective to move quicker and leverage some of the IRA funding and state level funding to update a bunch of these buildings now, even if the heating system has five years of life left in it or, or whatever, whatever the situation might be. So, um, I guess I would suggest or that maybe even we just mention that um, because I think we have to move away from sort of the more traditional costing of things if we're going to be able to make a case for why. I mean, the other point to make, and I know it's not necessarily true for natural gas given its current cost, but, um, you know, there's operational cost savings that can be achieved if we do a good job with heat pumps and and weatherization of some of these buildings to make them more energy efficient. So anyway, just throwing all that out there to include it your right up if you can. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, no, I understand that too. I, I think it'd just be interesting to maybe look at them both. Like, yeah, like the, sure. the, the one on the graph. And then also what if you consider age um, as one of the factors, just since I feel like for the most, there's kind of, I didn't show it because um, I kind of forgot to put it in there, kind of the histogram of and it, and it doesn't really tell the whole story because different equipment lasts for different lengths of time. Um, but there's kind of a wave of some new stuff tapering down and then a bunch of really old stuff too, ranging in the 30 to 50 years 
category. Yeah. And the reality <laughs> is we're not going to replace it all at the same time either. So we definitely need yeah. a phase approach. Um, so it's helpful to think about age in that, in that perspective as well. Right. Definitely. Thanks. Uh, Jesse. Um, yeah, first of all, I forgot to say mm -hmm. what you're doing is really tricky and really important, just like the greenhouse gas and just saying, so just also just a general sort of like, this is awesome. I'm so excited to see this work happening in Amherst, but you know, it's really, you're doing for the buildings, what Caitlin did for everything. And it's a great, it's a great look in, um, Laura mentioned weatherization and and I, I want to just speak maybe a little more specifically to that. And again, I know what it's like to be two weeks away from finishing a report and then have someone say, hey, did you do this? So <laughs> you do whatever you want to do. Don't worry about me. But what I would say is if you can incorporate some language and potentially even recommendations of what that tonnage wants to get to, to what's in other words what the weatherization needs to do to make it an optimized cost-effective solution it, it, none of these buildings can just go straight to electric they all need some level of envelope work and there is some targets and i'm going to recommend a place to find some of that information northampton has a capital improvement planning study to upgrade seven municipal buildings to net zero energy use um, that report um, has, I think, some good general language. It's just like to help Amherst benefit from that report, basically. And like, and, and in some ways, it's just like it's a BTUs per hour per square foot target number. And you don't have to figure out envelope plans just to get that concept in there in a, in a specific way. I think it would be super helpful. It's a couple sentences, really. If that doesn't make sense, reach out to Stephanie and she can reach out to me and I will hand that to you. Um, uh, in a, yeah. as, a, as, as well as I can. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I did write up, like I've started writing some stuff and that was kind of one of my assumptions slash parameters is that there is no envelope considerations in this report or in my, um, in my project, however, it would it, it like immensely help each building to lower its initial costs and operating costs uh, in an electric, all electric scenario. Yeah, but, it's still but, it's still valuable. The report still makes sense as long as you acknowledge that component. So right. that's good. Yeah, but yeah, having something more specific with numbers would just strengthen that argument for sure. So I just wanted to echo what what Jesse said that this is the sort of numbers that we wish we could get for you know every building and every uh, every every structure in town. Um, there's been a lot of talk about this in the last year about writing into rental bylaws, getting information about what the heating system is and what the energy usage is, and um, we haven't been very successful at being able to get that sort of information. So this is fantastic, um, and I want to I want to really thank you. Can I ask that you go back a couple of slides to the formula that you wrote down, the first one um, there, where you're trying to understand the heating demand estimation. I do, I'm a, I warn you, I'm a, I'm a physicist, so I'm gonna geek out a little. Okay. <laughs> I've been doing similar sorts of things um, this year, thinking about similar sorts of things. And, um, you're taking the, can you go through this again, what you're doing here? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm only using this for a building that has, uh, it's heated by uh, fossil fuels. And right, because not... then you know exactly how much is being burned. So you know how much energy is getting pumped into that building. It makes it easy. That part I get. <laughs> right, yeah. I thought about using it for electric resistance, but then I immediately realized that I wouldn't be able to split it up between lighting and anything else that's happening in that building. So just for fuel. Um, so we've got the three different kinds of fuels, propane, oil, gas, and they're all in different units and they all have different amounts of energy per unit. So yeah. I'm converting that into a like unit 
kilowatt hours. I did the same thing <laughs> when I did this for my own house and for other, yeah, I do the same thing. It all goes into kilowatt hours. Um, then what are you doing with it? Then uh, I'm dividing it by the heating degree days in degrees Celsius. Um, so that's the, those are the right. number of degrees per day below so the you're average. Getting it, you're getting an energy usage per day. Mm -hmm. um, and then multiplying it by the boiler efficiency. So it's taking this amount of fuel and it's not considering anything after the boiler. So it's just how much it's taking in and how much it's putting out. So of course, there's going to be more losses gotcha. right. uh, throughout the system, but I don't have that kind of information. Um, and then multiplying it by the set point, that's what calling for heat within the building. That's so, where you're losing me a little bit. So maybe we can talk about this offline, but I'm not quite sure what you're doing there. And you made a somewhat scary sounding comment about the answer depending on the units, which it shouldn't if the... <laughs> so, it might have so, just, that might have just been, uh, you know, you just have one line in Excel and I tried changing it all. And I said, you know, I'm just going to keep it in Celsius, but you can, the cell references the Celsius degree, but you can change the set point in Fahrenheit just because that's what we all use. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I found this formula in Celsius and I just didn't want to, I just didn't ever change it. Okay. Um, yeah. If you ever want to talk more about that, I'm happy to chat with you about it. I'm a little lost on that last point there, but, but I okay. get what you're trying to, I absolutely get what you're trying to do because it's the same thing I did for my own house when I did a transition this year and that I've been thinking about for a couple other people's houses or <laughs> starting. Cool. Yeah. And th this is just something that I got, uh, from an HVAC. Mm -hmm. person okay. um and that's how they they roughly calculated it's a little bit more precise than just the area of the condition space right um because it considers what you're replacing and how efficient it it is or was right. okay i don't want to take up a lot of time geeking out so sure. <laughs> so i want to thank you both again are there any other questions for miguel or caitlin i actually have a quick comment and request if that's okay mm -hmm. Lori. Um, kind of to Laura's point about all of the IRA and additional federal funding that is um, upcoming in my report, um, along with recommendations for action, I hope to point to some of these resources. I found a couple of good summaries from Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, but if um, any of you have information on that. Um, oh, so many. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you could send that my way, um, you know, it won't be a huge, like very in-depth part of the report, but just to, to plant seeds and point in the right direction. I would appreciate that. Okay. You should check out the minutes when they are updated and posted because the IRA discussion that we had last week, the link is now in the minutes or will be, um, awesome. but there's also, are you on the, um, building electrification accelerator mailing list? I don't think so. Massachusetts, um, I can I'll forward you out. both that information. If I'll, I'll give it to, well, Stephanie is on it, so she could also get it to you. I don't have your email addresses, but um, unless they were on the last uh, mailing to everyone. So if, if I have your email, I'll send you that directly, but that mailing list is invaluable. They have everything. <laughs> And Thank you. Everything. And they've been talking a lot lately about incentives and rebates and renters, what renters can do. So I actually have an internship they just posted for the fall. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they also post jobs. That's right. Not only internships, but but you know, regular jobs. So yeah, you're gonna want to be on that list. <laughs> so thank you both. Yeah. Um I, I just want to say uh, thank you to, to both Caitlin and, and Miguel. Um I've been busy taking notes, so haven't really been able to ask questions, but um uh and just a hi to Miguel, a uh, student uh, who was in one of my classes uh, last uh, last fall uh, and, and the spring. Uh, so great to see this uh, wonderful work for the town and um, and finishing up your practicum. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. Thank you. So thanks to both of you. Um, I guess you're welcome to stay the rest of the meeting if you want to, but you don't need to. Um, I think we're going to go on now to uh, updates. So I don't know that uh, the first thing under updates is heat pumps, and that's me. And I don't have anything specific to say about heat pumps. We're all just waiting on that um, 
RFP, uh, the, the heat pump program that was in legal last week. So I don't have too much more to say on that other than I continue to get requests from neighbors <laughs> about, about uh, you know, how to go about getting started converting the heat pumps, who they talk to, um, how do they know who to call. And uh, so I think that's really good. It, it, it speaks to the need for a program where, you know, they can call a number in the town and get some expert on the line who can help them think through the process and maybe recommend um, or if not recommend, at least give them a list of qualified installers. Um, so I don't have anything more to say about just, that. Just for the minutes, Lori. Um, so we're we're awaiting funding announcement from the state. No, no, we're we're awaiting. There is um, the town has a uh, heat pump program that they've been putting a. I guess it's a request for proposals or a solicitation of some sort. Oh, get out there yeah. and it's with legal because uh the the issue was that um they want to give money out <laughs> to buy heat pumps and they're not allowed to use i guess this is is this arpa funding i don't even remember where the funding is coming from the funding is not allowed to be used for you know individuals to install heat pumps but it could be used to uh, you know, to, to lift up a particular community, right? To, it has to be a community use. So there has to be the um, argument made that, this is my understanding anyway, Stephanie would be able to say better, that, uh, you know, that, that taking uh, marginalized communities and giving them access to this, um, to heat pumps, to, to clean energy is a community good. And I think that's what they're trying to do is figure out how to say that. <laughs> So um, that's the last I knew it was stuck in legal over that, something like that point. Um, it has to benefit a group. It can't just benefit individuals, I think. It has to benefit a community. So um, anything under, how about solar? How's the solar uh, bylaw working group going? Dwayne, I think that's next on the. Yep. Uh, no, no uh, dramatic updates except we continue to meet and uh, basically um, we have a extended meeting uh, on Friday. If anybody wants to join, we're actually starting. Uh, Stephanie will get these announcements out starting at ten thirty as opposed to eleven thirty, uh, with the first hour uh, being primarily a conversation with the town council. Not, uh, legal counsel um, uh, with regard to questions that we posed as a as a working group um, with regard to our um, limitations and advice on how to structure some of the zoning language um, and, uh, and, 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 and abilities. Um, and then we're going to be really starting to dig into the first of our two primary areas that we need to grapple with. Um, first up on Friday is really how we want to approach as zoning recommendations. These are all recommendations uh, to uh, to the town uh, approach a zoning with regard to farmland. Um, and then uh, subsequent to that, we'll work with um, issues around zoning for solar on in 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 or um, on forested land. Uh, and so uh, we have sort of a, uh, a framework to discuss on farmland on Friday, and we'll see um, where we get to. Uh, and that will be, uh, I think, the, um, a substantial accomplishment uh, if we can reach a, a reasonable consensus, and then we'll move on to the forest, uh, forest issues. Thanks for the update, Dwayne. Sounds like, um... Unfortunately, I won't be able to attend on Friday, but it would be interesting if um, you know, to hear back from any ECAC members who can attend. And, and of course, you explain how that, how that meeting goes. Um, yeah. All right, uh, anything else? Any other updates on um, heat pumps or solar? Any other questions regarding heat pump or solar efforts? If not, solar outreach. Um, Laura, this was sounds like a continuation of last week's discussion. Yeah, and I 
have zero control of my inbox. Um, and so I sent something to, did Stephanie send out that solar outreach campaign idea document that I shared? I, I think you, you, I asked you about that and you sent it to me, um, but I think what you sent me was an email that she had sent. So let me take a quick look. I think she had sent it. Stephanie, please, yeah. So Stephanie sent out, and I had lost this too. On, okay. I, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. On July 19th, Stephanie sent to the committee um, uh, a couple of links from Laura. One was for the solar outreach campaign idea, which is a nice document how to do this campaign. And the other was the um, webinar link directly. And I admit, I have not had a chance to look at it yet. I've just been swamped, but um, on my list of things to do. So yes, that did go out to the committee um, Wednesday, July 19th. So that would have been our last, was that our last meeting? That yeah. Meeting. Okay, great. So I'm just, just glad that it, that it went out. Um, so, um, so yeah, so this is a campaign idea. Um, this is a very rough draft. I didn't spend a ton of time on it. Um, but the idea being that, you know, there's a lot of um, there's a new direct pay provision in the IRA, which is going to allow non-tax paying entities to directly access um, basically the same amount of, and sometimes more incentives that they previously have not been able to directly access. Um, so previously, if a school wanted to, to do solar, they would have to partner with a private company that could leverage the tax credit and it would be a whole process. Now, it should be easier for schools, towns, municipalities, faith-based organizations, NGOs to own and operate their own solar. Um, and I believe it also has implications for electrification and other and other things. So, but specifically on the solar, you know, we talk a lot about wanting to maximize solar on rooftops and other spaces. And this seems like a really great opportunity to connect with other groups in town to try to raise um, awareness about this. Um, so potentially, um, so my sort of idea here is that we would start with probably an, an educational campaign of some sort. So um, identify groups that we could partner with, um, reach out to people that might be able to speak to this. I, I think I noted last time and I included the link here to this Evergreen Action blog post, which includes a link to a webinar um, that had some experts on it, including someone from UMass. So, um, Laura, it occurs to me that that this probably should have been in our packet, and I don't think it was. Do you want me to share the document with everyone? Yeah, sure. If you have it open and you I want to share it. I have it open, yeah. Why don't I just go ahead and share this? It's open in my browser. Um, so give me a second. Um, I'll just share this browser. Uh, share. There it is. Okay, did that share correctly? Or did that share something else? What just shared? No, I see it, yep. Is it there? Because it keeps yeah. hiding these windows on me every time it does this, this is very annoying. There it is, okay, got it. Um, okay, good. So this is the document that, that you put together. Yeah. Um, um, so there's a link to the resources there, which I encourage anyone to check out if they haven't. Um, it's quite a good webinar. Um, but anyway, so my initial idea, it's not particularly innovative. So if folks have other thoughts on how to do this, I'd welcome them. But basically, get a list of partners, get a list of non-tax paying entities that we want to engage with and host some kind of educational sector session, develop outreach material, um, and then, you know, follow up and support follow through. So my 
basic idea is that we have an info session, we develop some material based on what we hear of that info session and and get that material out to all of these non-tax paying entities. Um, I can suggest also adding um, local energy advocates to that list because they are also looking, I mean, they're the group that I think work to help try to get together the CCA from which that seed happened. And they're always talking about, you know, what's the next step? What's the next step? How do we develop our own clean energy sources? And so yeah, so actually my email to you all was to help me fill out this list. So yeah. I have not completed either of these yeah. lists by any sort of imagination. And I can be the contact for that since I usually go to the, they didn't have a meeting this month, but they will have one next month or this month. Okay. Yeah, so it would be great to get all of these groups. Um, anyone else who um, um, yeah, and Stella, thanks for adding some 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 points here. I started to get down the list of um, and I had a list of experts, and maybe I thought Dwayne, I think you could potentially add some folks here. Started putting down these lists, and then I got, you know, I think there's a ton of opportunity here, even with just all the schools and and everything. Um, so I welcome any um, this was like my five minute. Um, yeah, I was meaning JCA, sorry, not JCC. Um, I think there's a bunch more we could put on. I haven't, I haven't given it much thought, but um, so welcome folks to add to this list and add any um, contact information that they, that they might have. Um, it'd be great, sort of my, maybe my hope is that we could find at least one partner organization that would be really willing to run with this and help us organize it. Um, particularly if we could find one that has like, because, you know, we're limited in terms of we don't have any funding, but if we could find a partner organization that does have some funds, like to help make um, flyers and, and like do all the things that would be helpful. Um, so. I think a first a first first step would be getting a getting a group of partners together and having a meeting, mm -hmm. um, and maybe just one or two of the of us from ECAC could could participate and report back. So anyway, I'll pause there. Okay, this is great. We should definitely take this up again. I'm sorry I I dropped the ball on this one a little bit. I meant to um, do a little more with it. Um, but this is great. And does everybody have that link or should I send that email to everyone again? I have the email from uh, Stephanie and I can just forward it to everyone again if you, if you need it. That, that would be good. I always send it again. <laughs> okay, I'm just sending That's it always going to be comment. the answer. Send it again. And, and this is without comment because you don't want to be doing you know, offline uh, meeting, right? So just there it is again, just so everyone has it again. Uh, I'll just throw, throw in uh, two additional things yeah. um, that I think this is great to get ahead of this uh, because it's a it's a real game changer and appreciate Laura taking taking this on and 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 recognizing this as an opportunity for for the town. Um, I think two things. One is we're ahead. Of, we're a bit ahead uh, in that um, the you know exactly the rules of of what these nonprofits would do to claim this direct payment is not um, worked out yet. So it's like there's not any anything to to get yet because it hasn't been worked out in, in rules. Um, that being said, preparation and getting ahead of this and we're not asking anybody to, anybody to file for a reimbursement quite yet. Um, uh, so getting ahead of this and being ready in, in six months when it might be available uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, I would also say that there's another program uh, that EPA just announced a, a couple of weeks ago called Solar for All. Um, that is a um, not a gazillion, but billions of dollars uh, that are being spread around uh, a, pretty formulaic uh, lead to each state, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars potentially for Massachusetts. 
um, that would most likely be going into the state centrally, but then dispersed in various ways. And despite its name, Solar for All, um, it's really focused on solar for um, those um, less fortunate amongst us uh, and, and, gaining, and really providing them access to solar. Uh, so it's solar for all because the rest of the market takes care of the, the rest of us. But this money is really targeted specifically to low income, uh, disadvantaged communities uh, uh, and, and, and uh, energy burdened communities. Uh, so if we can, and that again, that's going to be a year and a half before it's money available, but also something to prepare for. Um, and, and the fact that um, these disadvantaged communities, many are low income nonprofits, um, can now also get the tax credit from or the direct payment from the federal government. Um, this money will go even even further. So we might, I'll keep uh, um, follow what the state is doing with regard to the solar for all, but um, that's also something you might think about in this uh, campaign and outreach. Yeah, that's a good point, Dwayne. And I think um, we should definitely, I think if we aim to have an education session in the fall, um, I think you're right. I think, you know, some of these details won't be worked out, but um, we can get the ball rolling and get a group of people together who want to work work on this. I think the other thing that I know from listening to that webinar that's not worked out yet, but, you know, it is, it's a, I think it's intending to, it's intended to be a direct payment, meaning like once you've got your system on place, you fill out some form with the IRS and they send you a check, right? But there's still potential limitations there. And so I think one of the things that we could maybe do as a community is like, is there a way that we could partner up with the credit union, with the college, with Amherst College or with others that could provide these like, you know, bridge loans at no interest so that we aren't handcuffing folks that can't pay that full upfront capital um, or making them pay, get, get a, a private loan that has a high interest rate. So um, that's like, I think to get this conversation started, we need to include that that in the conversation. Um, and I'm hoping by enticing groups like Amherst College and others into these meetings because they would also benefit that we could also maybe start to yeah. raise these these issues. Um, I did have one other thing I wanted to flag around the um, sort of related, but also not quite directly related from the webinar on the the on this the um, network geothermal, but I'll pause and, and um, Lori, let you, let you just tell me when I should talk about that. Um, I think since we don't have staff updates today, unless any of you have a staff update um, from Stephanie or someone else, uh, that we're going right to member updates anyway. So if you wanna just keep going, Laura. Um, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, great. Well, just to close the loop on the solar, if folks can just go in that list and start to add, particularly partners, so that maybe we can start in contact information, then we can start to maybe um, plan first that partner meeting to just talk to folks and see their thoughts on it. Um, and But of course, welcome also any additions you can add to the non-tax entities that we'd wanted to invite to a meeting. So um, I'll leave that there. So I don't know if anybody else was able to attend that network geothermal funding meeting. Um, I'll send around the slides and the recording. Um, it was quite good. I was super impressed with HEET, the folks from HEET that were presenting. Um, this is a, so um, there is a funding Funding opportunity through build, the Building Electrification Accelerator, I believe, um, to give 10 to 12 communities $50,000 to do a feasibility study for ne network geothermal. 
And um, an interesting point that HEET was making that I hadn't personally hadn't thought of was around um, the, the just transition challenges with individual homeowners switching to geothermal or, or not even geothermal, switching to heat pumps and off gas. Um, and actually maybe I'll share my screen so I can show this slide because it was really compelling. Um, and again, I'll, I'll share these slides with you all. Um, but um, the point she was making with, on this slide in particular is that because the gas infrastructure, unlike oil, where we have individual oil tanks and individual heat pumps, and there's less of a distributed system, right? Although it's still a bit that way, but gas in particular, it costs a certain amount of money to maintain. And every time a customer gets off of gas, that money to maintain is not changing. It's just being distrib redistributed to all the remaining gas customers. So if everyone in my neighborhood gets off gas and goes to, although we're not on gas, but let's pretend we are. If everyone in my neighborhood gets off gas and moves to heat pumps and um, there's another neighborhood down the street who has not been able to do that, they're going to start paying more for gas, their gas. Um, so it, it was sort of a really good I mean, there's lots of good reasons why we should consider these sort of network systems, but I thought it was a, a reason that I hadn't particularly thought of myself directly. Um, and so, and there's two test cases, I believe, one in Lowell and one in Framingham um, that they've already already done. But all to say, um, it was a very interesting webinar. Um, and they have some funding available. They were very clear that 50K is not gonna be enough necessarily to do a really robust feasibility study. Um, however, you know, they were offering up some ideas for matching funding. And again, I think there's an opportunity here for us to consider whether we could get some matching funding, if not from the town, you know, from some other entities that might be interested in thinking through this. So. I will, my plan was to share these slides with you all, but also with Stephanie and Paul and the town council. Um, anybody could apply, like I, I, obviously we would need to work with Stephanie, um, but I think we should probably encourage uh, Amherst to, ap to apply for this so we can do this feasibility study. Okay, thank you, Laura. That's really um, interesting. I was making my own notes so that I don't forget to talk to um, Stephanie about this. Um, so, and the uh, woman explained it way better than I did. So you should watch. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I'd be very interested in, in um, seeing those slides. Uh, so you'll. Pass them around, Laura, or we'll get them to Laurie to uh, distribute. And it was there a recording to the webinar as well? Do you know? There is a recording. Yeah. So I'll send, for some reason, it went to my work email. So I will send it to myself and then I'll send it to everybody in a minute. <laughs> okay. And I, I will distribute it. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll just send it to you, Laurie, and you can distribute it. I think I have everyone's email. Um, I had a brief update. I just wanted to mention if anyone else noticed that the um, gas pipeline extension in Springfield has been put on hold by the state as they're asking for a, <clears throat> they claim that Berkshire Gas did not, <clears throat> I think it's Berkshire Gas, did not um, include in their environmental impact the effect on carbon emissions, on, on greenhouse gases, on, on warming you know, greenhouse emissions and they need them to redo the environmental impact study to include the effect on the state's climate goals. <laughs> so um, 
that's good. It's not as good as saying they're not going to do it, um, but it's it's. Uh, <clears throat> I was encouraged to hear that. <coughs> Are there any other ECAC member updates? Um, I'm going to be at the CRC meeting on August fourth. What's today? No, maybe August 3rd. I'm sorry, CRC is, remind me, too many acronyms. This is, jeez, oh, I was hoping no one would ask me that. It's the Community <laughs> Resource Committee. So this, this is on the specialized code. So they, at, at the town council meeting, they referred it to CRC, which is a subcommittee right. of the town council. Specialized will, code, right. <clears throat> okay. Attend that meeting. Anna uh, and Stephanie both can't make it. I think it's tomorrow. I think it's August 3rd. And we will be here. The, I, the goal of that meeting is to um, hear kind of concerns and questions and comments about why, you know, pros and cons, or not even pros and cons, but just sort of like, what are the concerns? What are the people's questions about going from the stretch code to the specialized code? I've already spoken with a, a few council members and heard their specific concerns. Um, and so I'm, and what I think the, the deliverable that comes out of that will be kind of like an FAQ sheet, which I'm starting to work on, which will basically be like, will this make it so Amherst explodes? No, like will, you know, will, or will it add costs to buildings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, that's the um, big one that there's lots of- the town, Will it be a burden to the staff? And 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 my goal is to put together sort of as objective and rational as possible and not be too biased one way or the other and try to create kind of that fact sheet to give back to the town council. September 7th, I believe, is when they, the CRC meets again as a more kind of public input kind of way. I'm not entirely sure, but that's when I would kind of give answers. So. I think I'll probably have a draft that I could share with this group before September 7th. Um, in my research, I've dug in pretty extensively to the literature and the sort of studies where say like, it says it's gonna be unaffordable to build a house now. Um, I don't think that's true based on a, reading these articles. Like if you look into the studies, the, the amount that it changes the cost of the house is, is minimal compared to, I'll give one example, then I'll move forward. For example, there's a base house that has three bedrooms and three and a half bath bathrooms. Um, I think it's reasonable to say uh, you, you could save four times as much money by having a three bedroom two bathroom house than what may be required. So it's, it's, it's sort of a red herring. Like the amount of money is nothing compared to the many other choices that go into the design and construction of a house. And I'm gonna to try to find a sort of non-judgmental, less soapboxy way to say I that. Think, I think you need to be careful because I think in the long run, especially taking into account long-term savings, I think it ends up being cheaper, right? There's, there's been a lot of discussion on BEA about exactly that point lately, right? So they, they have, uh, have you been watching that chatter? No. Okay, you should, I'll try to forward you one of the more relevant email chains because they're, this is exactly what they've been discussing lately. I have not been reading the email chain very carefully but there was a, someone somewhere had the same issue where someone at their town meeting or whatever it was complained this was gonna raise the cost of housing. Oh no, it was a Boston Globe article that claimed yeah. this was gonna yeah, yeah. increase. And it's, it's wrong and they've already written a rebuttal and there's, there's, it, it just generated an enormous amount of chatter on exactly that point. Uh, so I'm sure you'll find interesting tidbits you can pull from there. Yeah, that would be great if you could forward that. I mean, like, that's what I'm finding is I, the Boston yeah. Globe article is wrong. Um, it makes sense. It's written by home builders and, and real estate agents. Um, yeah. it, it's super biased. But, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to, like, you know, this is a good 
venue to sort of say it out loud. Right. Um, but if when 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 I write it down and it represents this group, I want it to be, uh, you know, unbiased and 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 sort of reference. But yeah, for every one article, like there's two other studies that show the cost going down. Um, yeah. or being cost neutral and exactly. the operational costs it's just it's really um exactly i'll, I'll try to find the if best if you thing. read if you read the study that was done at wentworth that's referenced in the globe article it just it, you can it's very easy to start questioning the conclusions that aren't the conclusions of the wentworth studies as much so it's interesting it's been fun to get into and uh be at the CRC tomorrow night and uh, come come watch and poke fun at us all. And but I think potentially September seventh might be a time when we would want more people there. I'll, I'll verify that. Yeah, just that'd be great. Quickly, just real quickly, Jesse, for the notes. Excuse my ignorance. What's this new code code called again? <laughs> The specialized code. Specialized. The discussion specialized policy needs to say like code. attending CRC to discuss going from stretch code to specialized code. Specialized code. That's the word I was looking for. Specialized. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it's specialized stretch code even or something like that, isn't it? Or no. I'll put that in there. <laughs> so and then the only other thing I'll say is I was out west um, in an unplanned trip uh for uh family personal family reasons but that aside i now know what 110 degrees feels like um oh dear this shit's real yep. so keep i, I want to know what, what swimming in the ocean at 100 degrees feels like yeah <laughs> that scares me you say that that should be another update. My my partner is an environmental journalist, and all of the envir journalist, environmental journalists right now are freaking out because this is the this is they're convinced the next fifteen months are going to be what they've all been dreading um, for years now. Because between the, the El Nino has hardly kicked in yet, and the fire season isn't even really here yet, and uh, you know all all this has happened already. So it's it's going to be a rough um, next couple of years. Yeah, I mean, if, and if the ocean currents stop. That that's there. They they yeah. They're all. I mean, I it's on the table. It's on the table. It's on the table. Very long time. It's on the table. They're not expecting that to happen right away, but it's on the. But it could happen. It's any time almost. It's it's pretty scary. It's pretty scary. Very scary. It's very scary. Yep. Um. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> the hot the hot tub Florida like pushed me over the edge last week like doing this work day in and day out like I try not to get discouraged but the hot tub Florida I was like I can't I can't read this <laughs> get it out of my face <laughs> yeah. who would want to go to Florida and, <laughs> and try to cool off in the ocean <laughs> that doesn't for me good. I think it was the 102 degrees in the Argentine winter mm. I didn't even see that one see <laughs> I have a, a friend who has been pushing for a better standard than the, um, what is it, they, they always, the weather service always reports the temperature and the feels like temperature, what do they call it, the heat index. But what they really need to be reporting is the wet bulb temperature, because when that reaches body temperature, we're all dead. Because <laughs> you can't cool. I mean, I'm laughing, but it's the horror sort of horror story. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's those wet, as the air gets more humid and the heat increases, um, you know, the, there are already a lot of people dying from the heat and it's going to get much, much worse. Um, and the wet cold temperature is the thing to watch. So at any rate, um, with that happy thought, uh, let's put on some items for the next agenda. Real quick, I, just, I, I have something I've noticed anecdotally. This is kind of just like in the chit chat, relevant chit chat category. Mm -hmm. But I've been like talking to a lot of people who want tree work done lately and like one thing I'm finding is that a lot of times like solar companies are telling people they need to cut their trees. And then anecdotally, this is totally anecdotal at this point. If people put up solar panels anyway, the trees like don't actually really influence like how much energy is like created by the solar panels. So I feel like there's this like false choice being presented a lot of times. 
Um, how, do, how do you get that? I don't understand that. If it's in shade, it has to affect the amount of power produced. My hypothesis and the hypothesis of some of the people I've been talking to is that the algorithms, because this is all determined algorithmically, like when the solar, I believe when the solar companies, like they plug it into software that says yeah. like your roof will be shaded, but like where they think the roof will be shaded doesn't always actually match the like reality of- Oh, so they're, they're thinking that the, the models are wrong, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's just something I wanted to flag. I'm like kind of keeping an eye on it as like a, a thing that's happening because of course like with all this like heating and cooling stuff i mean trees also influence like decrease the amount of energy you need to heat and cool so ideally we have solar and trees obviously like this is a whole big conversation but um i don't know it's just like an interesting thing i've noticed that i've like started paying more attention to and if anybody um comes across anything or hears anything or sees anything quantitative or qualitative in that category, let me know. Cause I think it's- I, I can say anecdotally that I have certainly seen lately in my bicycling around the region, a number of houses that recently put in solar that took out all of their trees. And I was sort of horrified. Yeah, and, I think so, solar companies are telling people to take out all of their trees, like no, like because of these algorithms that may or may not actually be, be um, true. Yeah, that's interesting. We've had the, I had the opposite problem. They told me my trees were fine and then they grew faster than I could ever imagine. And now I am trying to decide. <laughs> they, they've, cut, they've cut down production hedge. notably. In my so neighborhood, thinking, it's common can I for top people, them? Yeah, it, it's common for people to make hedges out of hemlocks in my neighborhood. So maybe. <laughs> Stella, maybe you could come. It's, it's the opposite problem, Jesse, but it is the same thing I'm talking about where the predictions are not matching reality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. I would just I would just caution Lori, your point that we shouldn't assume that just because all their trees are gone, it means they did it because of the solar company. Oh no, I wasn't. It could have been saying. that they had wanted to remove all their trees and then they had a reason to. So that was an excuse. Wanna... That's, I, was, I was thinking yes. that as I was saying it. I, some people just want an excuse to remove the trees and that's, yeah. and that's what they used. Um, but it is, I have seen several houses just this weekend um, as I was bicycling up through Shutesbury and Lake Wyola and down um, that seem to have really taken out a lot of trees recently. There's also a lot of, I mean, there's lots of reasons to take out trees, including that they're not yeah. healthy, right? Yeah. Um, so we just never really know, right. but anyway, it's a hot, it's a controversial topic. Yep. All right. So uh, meetings for the next agenda, Laura, will take up your, um, your, the, uh, IRA, IRA funding again, I think we'll get updates on <clears throat> transportation. Stella. And what was the other one? Uh, oh, um, Don, um, Pace, is there anything? Oh, actually, guys, I do have one more thing I want to share with everybody, which and maybe I can talk about it more next week. But RMI, yep. formerly Rocky Mountain Institute, now just no name, I guess, um, came out with these really cool state scorecards. Did anybody see these? No. <laughs> um, so they... Uh, they basically score um, anyway, it's it's fun to look at. Um, here, I'll just again share my screen really quickly. Um, um, so here's the website if you want to go to it, statescorecards.rmi.org. Um, so they use this uh um here i'll go to massachusetts they don't do all the states um they use this energy policy simulate simulator so none of this is perfect right um and they do it related to um not specifically related to the state plans, but related to how much the state needs to reduce to contribute to the U.S. National, nationally determined contribution. 
through the UNFCCC process. But anyway, it shows, of course, the sector emissions, which we all know in Massachusetts are mostly transportation and buildings. And then it goes through and it shows, it has this like cute little rabbit that shows how close we are to meeting our, our goals. So sort of overall, Massachusetts is not too far off 2030, but we're not there. And then it shows the different sectors. Um, and it shows as a whole, then it also shows by like specific things. And so what's really interesting, so electricity, we're not doing too bad. That's mostly driven by the fact that we were ahead of the game in, reti in retiring coal, but we still have work to do on generation. And then you go to building sector, we're really far behind, which is not surprising to anybody on this call, but, um, and building gas consumption, of course, is one of the, the areas transportation, we're not far off our goal, um, driven a lot by electric duty vehicles, but this in my mind is a red herring because we know that replacing everybody's car with an electric car is not a solution to our issues. And this one here, the light duty vehicle miles traveled reduced, we're like, have no plan for. Um, so, and this is, and I had, a, had one of my, um, team members look at all the states because I imagine all the states are behind on this light duty vehicle mile traveled reduction, which of what course- is, uh, Laura, what is that? What is light duty vehicle referred so to? So basically it's mode shifting. So instead of replacing every individual vehicle with an electric vehicle, we're, that's not gonna help us. We, that That isn't the only, doing that is not gonna meet our climate oh. goal. You mean walking or bicycling instead walking, of- Walking, bicycling, more public transit. Right, gotcha. Um, and so this is an area that, anyway, you saying transportation reminded me of this. And it's just further evidence that as a state, and then of course, as a local area, we need to be figuring out how we build mode shifting into our transportation strategy for greenhouse gases. Um, so anyway, these are very cool to check out. So I would recommend them for, for folks and that's it. Thanks. Would you send me a link to that as well? And I'll try to, that'll remind me yeah. to send it to everyone. Um, back to agenda items for next week. Higher funding, transportation pace. Um, there was something I wanted to stick on the agenda. What was it? Um, I had something that I wanted to bring up and now I can't think of what it was. Well, there, there is one thing I'd like to ask. Um, one thing that I've seen some of the groups I participated in do, we, we tend to at some point during the, during the um, meeting, talk about current disasters going on in the world and also current um, winds like the pipeline in Springfield getting stalled for the moment anyway. Um, would it be worthwhile having a little update at the beginning of the meeting maybe just with, you know, things going on in the world this week, both good and bad? Or is that something we don't need to hear again at this meeting? Like winds and, and you know, things to get us thinking about possibilities. I don't know if that would be useful or not. Anyway, send me a note if you think it might be useful or not. Having a list of sort of wins and challenges. <laughs> Keep us focused. Oh, I know what I was thinking about. The block party is coming up. Stephanie's not here, but I'm pretty sure the block party is in September. So we only have a couple more meetings before it. Would anybody like to take on organizing? <laughs> I assume there's going to be a block party this year. We'll put it on next month. Next, uh, we'll put it on the agenda for next time for sure. How about that? Because I'm pretty sure that's coming up soon. Usually in September. Anything else for the agenda? If not, then I will open the floor for public comment again. Uh, we have Eric here. Eric, if you have a comment, 
please raise your hand. And if not, then I think the only thing left is an adjourn. So do we have a move to adjourn? Jesse, did you have something? I move to adjourn. Ooh. Second. I'll second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. All right. Uh, see you all in two weeks. All right, thanks. Yep, take care. Bye. An escape. See ya. <laughs> okay. <laughs>